it's my uh, pleasure now to introduce the final panel for our program today. The vision for the Innovation X Lab Summits is to connect the thought leaders from industry with the national laboratories to foster new collaborations that will drive American competitiveness and provide benefit to collaborators. We hope that this audience will come away with their creative ideas to combine extraordinary ideas that will uh, found at the national laboratories to create surprising and impactful outcomes. This panel will explore several recent collaborations that provide examples of how to create meaningful partnerships. And so to do this, I'd like to have Connor Prashaska, Director of the Department of Energy's Office of Technology Transitions and Chief, Chief Commercialization Officer to come forward and he's gonna uh, moderate our panel. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right, good morning. Um, before we start, so they're not standing over there, they, <laughs> they can all join us. I'm gonna go ahead and have our panelists come up here and, uh, and take a seat. In what order? I will tell you what order, how about that? <laughs> Thomas Zachariah, like he owns the place. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with Eric Panning, who is, uh, well, let me get the, the correct uh, titles here. Eric Panning's engineer man, engineering manager of Intel Corporation. Uh, next up will be Ravi Prasher, who, uh, Ravi is Associate Lab Director at LBNL, or Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Then we'll have uh, Michael uh, Pachinko. Michael is the President of MAF Battery Consulting, followed by Paul Kearns, the Mighty Lab Director of Argonne National Laboratory. Then we'll have Tom Matthews. Tom is the Senior VP for Technology and R&D at Lincoln Electric. And then last but certainly not least, Thomas Zachariah, Lab Director for Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Please welcome our panel. So before I get started, um, this is the last panel of the day and we are getting close to, to ending the, the, the great experience we've had here. Um, I wanna circle back to, to where we started uh, we started with uh, an introduction and a welcome by, by Thomas and uh, an introduction to the secretary and me being able to give you just one quick minute of what we're doing at DOE with the Office of Technology Transitions and as of the new role in the Chief Commercialization Officer role. Um, first, I'd be remiss once again if I didn't thank uh, the amazing Oak Ridge team. Thomas, thanks for not kicking us out yet, uh, but we do have to, what would you say, we are getting kicked out at 1230, right? Um, so we... Uh, Thank you for not kicking us out. And, and more importantly, um, thank you so much to the hard work that everyone at the Oak Ridge team did. Mike Paulus, Jennifer Palmer, the entire team. Michelle, thank you for everybody uh, that's done so much work uh, to put this together. <laughs> and the OTT team got called out yesterday. So uh, the, uh, uh, we're excited for, for everybody's hard work. Um, the other group that I want to highlight because as the secretary talked about a little bit yesterday, in, in our mission to elevate uh, the continuing work of tech transitions, tech commercialization, tech maturation, making an impact, uh, it's important to know that it's not just a, a, a few individuals at headquarters talking about this. This has been going on for decades. So right now, if you are a tech transition professional, if you are working in commercialization in your particular labs, I see a bunch of you out there, will you stand up real quick? Uh, we have a tech transfer working group. We've got amazing professionals across the complex that are working and doing this every day. So I want to make sure that we highlight all the great work that's being done because uh, as you may or may not realize, Washington doesn't have all the answers. Uh, and that's being generous, saying <laughs> we have any answers. Uh, but what we do have is the ability uh, to really highlight, elevate, and work hard uh, to make sure that the hard work that's being done across the country every day to maximize the impact uh, is known. With that, I, I want to go back in history a little bit because people that have been following the Department of Energy for a long time, when we talk to them about what we're doing at OTT and with the Chief Commercialization Officer role, they kind of sometimes say, well, I didn't know the department was doing this stuff now. I didn't know that was happening. I didn't know there was a centralized mechanism that we could come contact. And, and I always put this slide up here because it's important to understand that 
Uh, the Office of Technology Transition is fairly young. It was created under uh, the, the previous secretary, Secretary Moniz, in 2015, uh, really focusing on getting some of our statutory goals accomplished, uh, convening the Tech Transfer Working Group, getting reports up in a timely manner to the, to the Hill so that they know how we're doing with licensing, where this technology is going. Um, and it took a small dedicated group to really push that forward. It wasn't until 2017 that it became a dedicated budget item, which only matters to people in DC. Uh, that what that means basically is that it's not just at the secretary's discretion anymore. It was an actual budget that Congress said, you're gonna belong, you're gonna exist, and, and it's gonna be a little bit tougher to get rid of you. Uh, and then finally, the, the final portion of that progression was, as, uh, as the secretary mentioned in November, uh, creation of the first chief commercialization officer um, and, and the, the role that I now, that I now uh, hold uh, it, it, when that happened. And that was really a, a, a push to elevate the mission, as we keep saying. Um, but it, it's gone on for a long time. And what I'm excited about with this panel is this isn't a, a panel that we're, we're just gonna, you've heard commercialization a lot and we've talked and had a great discussion, but hopefully this kind of rounds it out with some real examples uh, of how the cooperation can work. And it's not just even in advanced manufacturing, it's across a number of different industries, but some success stories and then some conversations on how these happen so that if anything has kind of sparked a, a, a thought in your mind, has kind of said, oh, I hadn't even thought about working with that particular lab. I've heard stories, uh, we hear them at every X lab, but in particular, I've heard it multiple times in, in the networking sessions and dinners and lunches uh, of ideas of how we can connect better. Hopefully this session gives you one more opportunity to think about that and that the conversation doesn't end here, that the conversation moves on. We've done amazing things from Sandia working with Goodyear Tire to maximize their, their abilities for almost a quarter of a century, uh, to MRIs, to solar, to wind, things that you've heard about multiple times. Um, but I want to go a little bit deeper and really give some specifics here. And I'm going to read a lot of these because I don't want to leave any of the details out because they really capture how fascinating. Starts with uh, a team out of Iowa, uh, two grad students that spun up a startup called Iowa Powder Atomization Technologies. Uh, this came out of Ames Laboratory. And what they did is they found new ways to use 3D printing uh, with extremely fine titanium powder. It opened up an entirely new materials and a miracle for metal when it comes to 3D printing. At Argonne, they worked with an industry partner to tackle a similar problem in production of tiny, high-value nanomaterials. These are actually famous for being hard to produce, but the lab teamed up with Cabot Corporation with the support of EERE's VTO office, or Vehicle Technology Office, to develop a new kind of flame spray, which is awesome, uh, that, uh, that's now faster and, more importantly, takes less time and less waste, saving money. When you talk about Idaho National Lab, where a partnership with nanosteel has led to the development of a new steel alloy that is twice as strong and costs less. That means lighter trains, planes, automobiles, not to mention mining equipment and heavy duty machinery. This licensing, uh, since INL licensed it in 02, nano has gotten, nano steel has gotten investment from GM Ventures, Lear, Intertech, and Fairhaven Capital. And last September, they actually launched an all new company to focus exclusively on additive manufacturing called Formatrex. The new business hopes to accelerate the adoption of advanced manufacturing in the incumbent tool and die cast models industry. Excuse me, die casting industry. And of course, you know what's not bad is if you can team up with the good old United States military. Uh, unfortunately, they chose the Air Force instead of the Navy, but we're just gonna keep it going. Uh, the, uh, when the Air Force was complaining that the, the 3D parts didn't have the structural integrity that they really needed, Brookhaven worked using X-ray and light sources to, 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 to look inside the components and really figure out how they're actually being made, improving the ability to make tough parts that can withstand the battlefield and, yes, up in the wild blue yonder. And making things bigger is always better. I'm from Texas. so. The big area, additive manufacturing right here, which we've talked about a lot, BAM, which is probably the coolest name uh, of anything, here at Oak Ridge has been one-upping itself since it was created. Uh, and we've heard tons about the BAM uh, abilities, and we've seen it right here on display. You know, we also 
work to train our researchers. And we train our researchers through things like our Energy i program. And we work to make researchers more entrepreneurial-like. I'm actually proud here to talk a little bit about our Energy i program, which just graduated its largest cohort. It had 12 teams across six labs. Uh, and we hope to eventually expand to all the national labs. But by partnering with these intrepid researchers who are stepping a little bit out of their comfort zone and crack instructors that we bring in, which if anybody ever wants to be an i instructor from industry, we always have the doors open for that. We work across our complex to make sure that, that we are doing all we can to put the tools in the hands of our researchers to be as successful as possible. Back to some stories. Some of the amazing Quantum dot technology, powered by quantum dot technology, you now see some of the most amazing scenery you possibly can on Samsung, Vizio, and even your Kindle. This was developed at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in collaboration with Nanosys, who realized the potential of an ultra pure colored light coming from these tiny structures. It actually made, it sh made sure that the next wave of high tech TVs was coming from technology here in the United States. Competitiveness is a critical part of why OTT works to support you as they write their own success story. <clears throat> as I've said before, we have a duty to the taxpayer and to the nation to effectively and efficiently use the funding they've entrusted to us to ensure the United States stays atop the economic ladder. And that we also keep our people safe and secure. Our power grid is vast and vulnerable, which is why the department has doubled down on cybersecurity, leveraging emergent tools like AI, machine learning, to predict and respond to threats, both natural and human. We're also striving for greater efficiency across our critical technologies, like the collaboration between the National Energy Technology Net Lab and Metglass, Eaton Corporation, and Carnegie Mellon. Together, they've developed a way to produce super thin metallic ribbons from a new alloy on a path to a new generation of high performance inductors, the backbone of the power grid and electric motors. And Forward Progress at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory is leading more efficient power electronics in mobile applications. Their partnership with John Deere Electric Solutions has led to the development of a silicon carbine power inverter that's integrated directly into the engine cooling system. This optimized design opens new avenues to reduce system and fuel costs while improving performance in heavy duty vehicles. This is funded through EERE. The two partners are working to demonstrate this amazing technology. These projects create tremendous value and showcase our ability to call on a variety of expertise and funding sources to create real impact in American lives. When the Secretary announced at CIRA Week about a month ago, we're in a new American energy era, he did so talking about, as he mentioned yesterday, moving from where we were in the crisis, and as, as Undersecretary DeBar mentioned today, of not having enough power to being a net exporter in the next few months of energy. Well, that's not just a celebration of the innovation that has changed the world and the country, but it's also a rallying call for the continued new American in innovation era, an era where our innovation will continue to push forward, the innovation that we've talked about in the labs, the innovation that's going on today that will change tomorrow. We've also talked about the fact that a new American energy era, to quote the secretary, means a path to a zero emissions energy here in the United States. That path will come from innovation. We recently worked towards a, and, and worked with our, our colleagues at NIST, and NIST published this return on investment initiative. It's a green paper. Don't ask me what a green paper is. I know what a white paper is. I know what other paper, the green paper is there. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of debate on that, actually. But what the green paper that just recently was released in April uh, outlines is how we can maximize across our federal research and development system the impact and return on investment to the U.S. taxpayers. We work on these policies every day from the Department of Energy all the way up to the White House to the entire lab, federal lab system and research and development area. As I mentioned, we're working for better policies in DC, better access, and more promotion in telling the story. If you haven't seen our lab partnering service, labpartnering.org, please go to it, 
break it, figure out what's wrong with it. Hopefully we'll get to a point where you won't even know it's a government website. But use this tool. It connects researchers, it connects facilities, and it connects technologies. It's how we are trying to reach out and push our message to you and understand how best we can make it more accessible and more attractive. I've talked a little bit here, but I want to leave a lot of time for this great panel, which demonstrates here three labs and three companies that have done what we've been talking about, who have connected who have made things happen and been able to get through, for those of you that didn't know what it looked like yesterday, this is the Forrestal building, to find the front door here, <laughs> literally can't find it, uh, to find the front door to Forrestal, come into this complex, and make some amazing changes happen. So with that, I've introduced our panel, and we'll kick it off with a few questions. Thank you all very much. So I think I'd, I'd like to start with the, uh, with the companies first, um, because a lot of people kind of end up in the sphere of the national labs, um, and, then, and then never, well, excuse me, I'm sorry, we're going to go through a few slides, actually, of everybody first. So I think Eric's going to go first here, and so we have a little bit of an opening and an intro to everything. So Eric, here you go. Sorry about that. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. And it's, uh, it's That's that one. So it'll, it'll advance in a second. I'd like to uh, uh, thank Connor and uh, everyone at Oak Ridge National Labs. I, I took advantage of the opportunity, arrived Sunday, enjoyed a bit of Nashville, but really enjoyed my time here uh, and took the full tour on Monday. For those of you that, that uh, missed it, I encourage you to, uh, to visit. I learned quite a bit. Um, so I've, I've been at Intel uh, for uh, quite a while, over 20 years, almost all of it in a patterning focus. And actually, over that time, I've worked with uh, Berkeley National Labs uh, for most of my career in different capacities in different programs. The, uh, uh, my current organization is uh, 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 Supplier Technology and Industry Development. I work with a number of consortia worldwide. But uh, you know, most recently, I'm working with uh, Patrick Nolo in the back and the Center for X-ray Optics at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs to further resist development and further uh, uh, UV technology for advancing uh, Morse law and uh, scaling. The, uh, the technology space that this is in is, is crucial to the, uh, uh, the fundamentals of scaling. If you can't uh, reduce the size of your features, uh, you have trouble uh, achieving the uh, node over node uh, scaling density. And uh, what I would uh, be showing shortly uh, will be kind of some of the history of the program with the National Labs. Actually, it, it goes back over, over 20 years, starting with um, uh, efforts with uh, uh, DARPA and then uh, you know, kind of a foundational uh, CRADA called the EUV LLC. Uh, it continues um, uh, today with the Eureka program, and in between, there's uh, extensive industry engagement with uh, Symantec. So uh, I don't know if uh, the slides will come yeah, up or not. Yeah, I don't not. know. <laughs> we'll see. There ah, they are. There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, this is actually where I was at. Uh, you know, this partnership, um, you know, I think the original DARPA investment uh, from the government was in the million-dollar space. The CRADA was well over uh, $200 million of industry investment. And uh, you know, I think just in Berkeley alone, it's really been over uh, $130 million in industry investment over this period. It's been a great, uh, great example of partnership. I wanted to show some of the uh, uh, results. Uh, you don't need to, to read the details here. What's important is the trend, right? We've been able to leverage our partnership with the labs it's been a sustained effort over this period. You know, on the left is the number of uh, uh, wafers examined. On the right is the materials. These numbers are in the tens of thousands. Uh, and this is really um, what it takes and what it's taken to advance the performance of the materials. Uh, 16 years of progress. On the far left is where we started. On the far right, uh, this is sub-10 nanometer resolution structures. This is. Uh, uh, 
uh, world-class results happening you know, right now at the uh, uh, Berkeley National Labs. And I think that you know, kind of touching on some of the topics from um, uh, this morning too, I think just as important uh, with the results is also uh, you know, how this has really enabled a number of key researchers uh, from, the, from the labs, from the Berkeley system, into Intel, into industry. There's at least uh, 20 plus, uh, including eight that have transitioned to, uh, to Intel. Um, and I wanted to uh, wrap up uh, building a better future. There is uh, you know, a, a lot of work that's been done. There's still um, uh, considerable opportunity. I think that you know, we're looking uh, in this year and beyond of expanding the program to look at opportunities to talk more about fundamentals and really getting to the bottom of uh, some of these material scaling challenges. I think that uh, as a testament to this, there's the recently commissioned HINA uh, uh, BMET 5 tool. This is to enable uh, ongoing advances in pattern material development and further resolution scaling. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna pass it over to, uh, to Ravi for, uh, for his update. Yeah, Ravi? Yeah, thank you. Well, I hope my slides work so. Which way I point? This one? No, no, this that one. one. Yeah. Okay. Don't use the laser pointer uh, because they're all out there. All right. <laughs> while, 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 <laughs> while we are waiting for my slides to load up, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. Uh, I think this is a much needed topic in the country uh, to discuss with, uh, with the broader community. So just a little bit about myself. Not too long ago, I was in the private sector. I started my career at Intel. I was at Intel for 11 years. And in fact, when I was until I did work with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we were working on a technology, and uh, we are we are facing certain roadblocks, and and we just did not have the tools to uh, investigate those things. So we reached out to Berkeley Lab, and used the molecular foundry there uh, to solve some of the issues that we were facing. Uh, then I went to RPE as a program manager for almost three years. Uh, after that, I was in a startup, and I worked with Oak Ridge when I was in the startup. Uh, so uh, I had a great fortune of working with Oak Ridge at that time. And then I had no idea that I will become a part of the lab system myself. Uh, so almost three and a half years ago, I joined the Berkeley lab. So what I want to talk about in the next couple of minutes is that Eric showed you, you know, greatly how labs have been engaged with advancing the conventional CMOS technology uh, and, 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 and going all the way from, you know, to up to two nanometers. Question is what next? And it's coming, right? And, and so we will have significant scaling and manufacturing challenges for technologies based on beyond Moore's law. And I want to say, point out that uh, semiconductor industry is one of the most highest paying manufacturing jobs in the country. It is very important for us as a country to maintain our technological dominance in this sector. We export a lot of uh, stuff based on semiconductor manufacturing. So now the question is that, okay, if we start looking at beyond Moore's law, that's a very big problem, right? We have been used to, you know, silicon is a great material and, and you know, the whole system is based, based on silicon. So the problem is so challenging that I would say that it will require multiple national labs to work together. And, and that has been happening in the system for the last two years or so. Many of these national labs you can see on the, on the screen, they've come together, they have come up with, uh, strategized together how to solve this problem. What are the big things needed? What kind of paradigm should will be needed in R&D? So, and, and things have been moving in, in, in DOE as well. Uh, Office of Science had recently run a basic energy uh, research needs uh, workshop, uh, particularly for my colleagues in the industry. If you're not aware of it, this is, this, these reports which comes out of Office of Science are great, full of information. Uh, also tells you what has, what's happening uh, in, in these various fields. And, and one thing which has come out of this, uh, this uh, 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 BRN report is that we need a paradigm shift. Uh, what we need is something called a code design framework. So you have to look at materials, manufacturing, as well as system architecture in a very holistic manner. And that's the reason that multiple labs and even academia, they have to come together and work with industry hand in hand from, from day one. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna share a couple of new developments that has happened beyond CMOS. So we have been working with Intel on advancing technologies uh, which goes, which does not use silicon, the conventional material. 
Uh, there's a, just a paper just came out with Intel on a magnetoelectric spin orbit logic. It's a brand new kind of a device. Uh, as you can see on the screen, it uses quite a bit of quantum materials, uh, uh, both uh, multiferroic materials as well as uh, uh, topological insulators. So again, these are very novel materials. So the question is, what are the manufacturing challenges and how can we use all the top-notch facilities we have at all these various national labs to understand the scale-up and the manufacturing challenges of these uh, new type of materials. So one thing which I would like to show that what's happening in the lab now is that we are using our synchrotron, uh, the light source at, at Berkeley, and we are putting a CVD chamber inside one of the beam lines uh, and really trying to understand that if we use the conventional CVD and ALD techniques to, to, to uh, make these materials and grow these new materials like the multiferroics and the topological insulators, what kind of defects we will see and, and, and what are the different kind of scale of challenges, right? So again, this highlights the fact that national labs have such tremendous facilities that they can really understand a lot of very complex issues uh, in, in, in some of the advanced topics by u utilizing both the scientific talent as well as the facilities. Thanks, Robbie. Yep. Michael's going to give us a little bit of his experience working with Argon. I'm the uh, presently I'm the chairman of the board for Scion Power, the highest energy lithium-ion battery uh, technology in the world. Before that, I was uh, president of Ovonic Battery, which was the inventor of nickel metal hydride batteries that are used in the Toyota Prius, for example, 10 million cars on the road, but. The period where between those two, I was the managing director of BASF, the world's largest chemical company. Argon and BASF did something extraordinary that was really covering the enabling <coughs> technology for electric vehicles, something that I think everybody uh, considers to be important. If you look at the cathode material in a battery, your laptop, your cell phone uses cobalt oxide. You love it, it works great, you like it. There's not enough cobalt in the world for electric vehicles to be made out of this. The cobalt comes from Africa, child labor issues. So imagine that if we wanted electric vehicles and we were gonna use a cobalt cathode, it just simply wouldn't work. The biggest component in a battery is the cathode. The cathode dominates energy, power, lifetime safety. So I'm gonna tell you it's the, the most important thing. What Argon and BASF collaborated on was the nickel, cobalt, manganese cathode materials, which are used in essentially all electric vehicles worldwide. It's the biggest cathode chemistry in the world it is the fastest growing, and almost all electric vehicles are using Argon's technology. The fly in the ointment was nobody was paying. So this is my friend on the left, Mike Thackeray, who I'd known for, he's the inventor of this NCM cathode technology, you might know the other guys too. All I wanna do is tell you, this was really high profile from three administrations, when Bush was in office, uh, visiting with Mike Thackeray, to when President Obama came in office, visiting Argonne on this technology, and when we did an enforcement, President Trump actually had to sign off on this as well. So this was a very high profile technology. Uh, BASF, this slide is, uh, that shows $70 million investment, I'll say the put the decimal point over. This is now two more factories have been set up in Japan and in the United States to manufacture this material. BSF has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in this cathode chemistry. Uh, and it's very simple. If you take a nickel, cobalt, manganese cathode, the cobalt has gone from 100% down to under 10%. And, but the nickel and manganese materials, they don't work. They don't cycle very well, so you can't really have an electric vehicle that doesn't cycle. What Thackeray and Argonne's invention did was essentially take reinforced concrete, where you put the steel slats in to keep the concrete secure. By putting a second phase into the material, now the NCM cathode is structurally reinforced. 
That's, that's how it works. That's how these batteries that are in cars today, that's how they do provide the energy and the cycle life that's needed. Problem was, nobody was paying. The innovation between BASF and Argonne was, you've got this chemistry that battery industry is saying, if a national lab is the developer, it's almost a license to steal. They'll never enforce the patents, they'll never enforce the te technology. Argonne and BASF took the extraordinary uh, step of Argonne giving the crown jewel patents to a private company, BASF, to enforce. We said, let us run the litigation, let us do the enforcement, we'll pay for it, we'll uh, uh, share the proceeds, you know, and, and thank God we won. So we actually had to go to court, we went to litigation, we proved the patents, covered the technology, the patents were valid, and you know, before we went to litigation, I should say we offered uh, the companies a license, so we, nobody wants to fight, uh, but we, we prevailed. And I'll, I'll close it up with, with a couple of comments, that just in the last 18 months, all of these companies have become licensees. So what was a chemistry that was developed by the taxpayers' money at Argonne National Labs that was being used by every battery company in the industry with nobody paying, now has been licensed over the last 18 months to a dozen companies. So when you go and you buy a, um, US companies or European companies or Asian companies, the, the cars, it's using a battery that was probably made in Asia, but now it's using a battery where the cathode material is licensed. It's a royalty bearing, upfront fees, and I'll tell you, this is, I, won't, I can't mention the details here, but the licenses weren't cheap. So people are paying a lot of money to use this technology. So you think about the National Lab and the partnership with BASF, it really accomplished something quite extraordinary. Paul? Paul? Yes, Alex. Mike is a very ex effective spokesperson. He's been a great champion for really uh, the technology and commercializing the technology. He's been a great partner for the laboratory. Uh, he's been with us from day one. Uh, about 15 years of effort is what he's really speaking to today. Uh, in terms of what it means to the laboratory, uh, it's really a wonderful story. Uh, we often talk about the National Laboratories and our science changing the world. This is an example of just that. Really, think about electrification of transportation, and not only contributions from Argonne, but many other many of the other national laboratories have really made this possible. And so we're quite excited about uh, really the impact that our science has really resulted in. Uh, we also uh, really found the confidence uh, that BASF expressed in the technology and the intellectual property, really as. Uh, uh, validation, if you will, of our science and the value of the science. And so it's really wonderful in that way. It's led to many new opportunities for Argonne. Uh, we have, uh, as many of you realize, uh, Linda Horton's here. Uh, she's the sponsor of the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, which is on the basic end, really thinking about beyond lithium ion technologies. But it's, it's led from research in the, in the basic all the way through the applied spectrum, if you will, uh, working with many uh, government and industrial partners uh, we're very excited about the future as well. It's also led to the stand up of a new initiative, uh, really thinking about the challenge of moving through that spectrum in manufacturing science and engineering at Argonne, really looking at advanced materials and how we uh, develop the need to process technologies to move those uh, advanced materials into manufacturing uh, at a commercial scale is really the challenge associated with that manufacturing science and engineering initiative. Uh, we have uh, many in, uh, industrial partners uh, working with us in this space. And we're very excited about the uh, replicating uh, the story that Mike has just shared. Uh, I will say one of my best days as a lab director at Argonne was when I got to sit down with the inventors of the IP that Mike is, uh, and others have really helped us commercialize and present them six and seven <laughs> figure checks, basically because uh, we share royalties with those employees, uh, very impactful. Uh, seldom do I hand out uh, you know, <laughs> that amount of money and, and really uh, sufficient to make a change in someone's lifestyle. And it was fun to hear the, 
uh, inventors talk about their plans to, in terms of how they intended to use uh, those funds, basically, to buy a new home, or of course one gentleman wanted to buy an electric vehicle. It, it was just a, really a fantastic day for me, and very exciting, so. Awesome. And then finally, Tom, I'm gonna talk about the Lincoln Electric and ORNL Oak Ridge, uh, large-scale robotic metal additive manufacturing side side. cooperation. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Tom Matthews uh, here from uh, Lincoln Electric. Uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to tell our story on this. It's really an interesting story that we have, and it's a uh,